Okay. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, it's one of the regrettable features of this class that we've had some fragmentation. And uh, uh, I want to begin uh, by uh, taking us back to where we were with respect to our thinking in previous lectures before pushing forward uh, aggressively. Um, so uh, you'll recall that um, in previous lectures on this board, now we raced, we had um, explored uh, the characterization of state equations um, uh, in the form of systems of ordinary differential equations where we have some state vector here denoted as S, um, which in general is a vector. So I put a put an arrow over it. And the rate of change of that state vector, so S dot, is given by some, um, some governing set of equations involving the state. With what uh, dictates that this is a dynamic system is that this right-hand side, f of s, depends on s. That is, the behavior depends on the current state of the system. Right? And um, just for basic, <coughs> basic matching of the uh, structures involved, um, uh, f is a, on the right-hand side, if s is a vector, we're taking the derivative on the left-hand side, it's equal to something on the right-hand side that also has to be a vector. And so this is a vector-based function of state, right? Um, so we're, we're characterizing state um, as S and we're taking some function of it um, to determine the rate of change of state, where this function is a, is a vector-based function. And, you know, in terms of particular components, if we were to refer to the elements of state without loss of generality as x, y, and z, for example, here, um, we might have rates of change of dot f x dot, y dot, z dot, and this right-hand side would, would give us a rate of change for each of them, vector based motion. And um, I had spoken earlier about the role that linearity and nonlinearity plays. And I had noted that for functions in general, if we have a function from x to y, um, we characterize that function as linear if, if there's this very direct homomorphism linking up its application in, in other words, it just distributes over addition. So f of, f of a plus b is simply f of a plus f of b, right? Um, we can, if we want to understand how the system operates on some input as a whole, here a plus b, um, all we have to do is decompose that input into pieces, say a and b, we know how, how it responds to those and we can simply sum up the results of how it, how it um, responds to each of those, f of a, uh, f of b, and add them together and, and get the response to the overall system. This is for linear systems. And it follows also that f of lambda times x, if we scale a given input, or in, in this case will be a state of the system by a given level, the result is simply that scaling factor times um, f applied to that that uh, state itself, okay? Um, and, uh, and on this board, we have previously gone through some examples, for example, with, with 2x showing that it's, uh, it, it uh, adheres to, it's true to these properties of linearity. But we had also introduced some nonlinear functions, like f of x squared, where it violates these properties, right? Um, so, uh, for example, if we had uh, f of x, if we considered, you know, x equals three, right? Um, we can't uh, just decompose that uh, into, uh, to get the answer, we can't decompose it into 
uh, f of 1 plus, you know, 2, and get f of 1 plus f of 2 was the result, right? Um, f of x for x equals 3 gives us 9, x squared. By contrast, if we tried to take it apart into its pieces, 1 plus 2, and we considered f of 1, well, f of 1 is 1 squared, or 1, and we took the other piece, 2, and we considered f of 2, it's 2 squared, or 4, we add them together, we get 5. That's a very different answer than 9, f of, f of 3, right? Um, so this is a nonlinear function. It violates these rules. Um, and in general, when we have these uh, systems of, of uh, uh, differential equations or ODEs, but it's more general than that. It's really where we have a dynamical system. Um, we can also characterize uh, at some level how it changes as a function of state. And this is very different for each of the three traditions we've looked at in more depth, right? For system dynamics, we have the state equation format shown on the board or shown here where we're dealing with the derivatives. For agent-based modeling, we have these hazard rates and timeouts which basically specify collectively how the system changes, how quickly or, or um, how, uh, um, in what ways it's changing based as a current function of state. And so it is for discrete event simulation because we have queues of people waiting for certain resources or queues of other entities, et cetera, right? Um, and the same basic principles apply from function, that apply to functions being linear or not, that, that adjudicate whether a function is linear or not, a carry over to these dynamical systems where this f, this vector-based function of, of s, is on the, the right-hand side, okay? And there's a lot of arrows here, but, but basically it's the same rules just applied to the right-hand sides associated with this, uh, uh, with the evolution of the system, okay? Okay, now, um, an important thing to note here that students sometimes get confused about is when we say a system is nonlinear, a dynamical system, we're talking about nonlinear in its state, not in, with respect to its parameters. It's not, it's not that, you know, its evolution depends on the square of this parameter or something like that. It's with respect to state. And if we have this as our state vector here, x, say x, y, z, suppose we were doing a 3D system, right? Or a system that's at least nominally 3D. So we have a state vector x, y, and z. Then these square terms, uh, for example, um, terms involving nonlinear terms, if we consider the, the sort of minimum uh, term there, it involved things like x squared, y squared, z squared, but also things like what? Give me another example that might be a higher order nonlinear combination of, of this state. Well, x, y, or y, z, right? Mm -hmm. And x, z, right? Yeah. So, so in general, we can have nonlinear terms involving these, and um, and uh, for nonlinear systems, we're going to have this property that I've emphasized before, but is really going to start to play a very important role in our reasoning as we transition to systems data science about the whole and the pieces. I mean, for linear functions, what we've seen is that we can, um, by the definition of, of a linear function, we can reason about its behavior with respect to the whole. That's the sigma here. This, this whole that is composed of pieces, we can reason about how it behaves with respect to the whole by simply reasoning about how it behaves with respect to each of the pieces and summing it up. It's just, it's nothing more than the sum of its parts. Hmm? And importantly, it's nothing less either, um, as we'll see. And that's, that's an important fact. Um, we can't 
you know, reduce the dimensionality in some way because of the coupling, because coupling is simply an artifact of how we're describing the system. So here, um, for a linear system, a whole is, is simply the sum of, of the parts. And within this context, in the context of these linear dynamical systems, um, they can be, as we saw last time, they can be naturally described, even if they are phrased initially in a way that, it, that seems coupled. That is that the evolution of one variable depends on another. Um, on the, so the evolution of one element of state, say x, depends not only on x but on y. Um, okay, I, 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 if I had planned ahead, I should have had one of those pictures that we saw where, you know, for instance, the perception related first order feedback where we have delays in perception, right? And, and you have this state, state variables which are the actual situation, the perceived situation, and the evolution of the actual situation is affected by the actual situation and by my perception of it because I might try to steer the steering wheel based on my perception of where I am in the road in a way that uh, uh, you know materially affects the the current state of the system. So, so nominally we may have a system that's that's linear frame, phrased to us in a way that's coupled. But what we saw last time is that through um, a simple change in how we choose to describe the system, a change involving our, the coordinate system in which we describe it, or the, the labels by which we describe it, um, we can actually turn it to a, render it into a system that's decoupled, where one thing doesn't depend on another. It just, um, each element of system evolves as a solitude away from the others in a way that it doesn't have to know about the others, no information is transferred between them. They just each evolve in their natural way independent of all the others, okay? Um, so th the capacity to do this for a, a dynamical system um, was rooted in the fact that um, for a linear system, we consider the rate of change of s as a function of s uh, for, a, for a very specific case of the linear system, um, uh, which, is, which characterizes many systems that we look at at just one point of time or just one point of state space around a certain, around a certain equilibrium point. Um, uh, you can characterize it as, as some matrix times s, where the matrix is the Jacobian. Okay, it's the Jacobian matrix of F, you know, with respect to this F. So it's, you know, the, the, the first row of it is the component of F that determines the first element of S, right? X. Um, and and we're, we're asking, how does that, how quickly does that change as we go in different directions S? You know, we go in the X direction, we go in the Y direction, we go in the Z direction. All of them are derivatives with respect to f sub x, um, the, the, how it's changing in the x direction, um, uh, and these are the rates of change there, and we're simply taking their dot product with s. Remember that? Okay. Um, so in any case, we can phrase these as a matrix times s. Traditionally, that matrix is written A. I happen to have uh, called it J. And what we saw last time, and I'm not going to go into it again, but it's a very, very important point, is that um, there's a natural basis system for describing the action of this system in light of this Jacobia. And that natural basis makes use of what as its basis vectors? Does anyone remember? It's the eigenvectors of this matrix. Those are the natural um, uh, the, the, sort of the natural coordinate system for describing the action of this matrix. Natural in the sense that they allow you to characterize the action of the matrix in a particularly simple way. And what is that simple way? 
Well, the simple way is it is it simply stretches or you know kind of pulls I don't know what you call it compresses um, so simply you know pushes out or stretch pulls in stretches in or stretches out um, uh, certain these these different eigenvectors and each one we don't have to worry about the others if if we just worry about how it handles this one and handles that one handles that one we can describe the behavior of the whole thing in short it allows us to diagonalize this matrix, okay? Um, and, uh, and that was shown previously, but the, the, the diagonal matrix, can anyone pick it out here? Where, where is it? Um, where is it denoted? It's lambda, it says capital lambda, right? Um, uh, so, so this capital lambda is the diagonal matrix corresponding to this one. And we can re-describe in its natural coordinate system this matrix J, traditionally written A, uh, uh, but we can, well, just in general, we write things as, as, as A when we decompose this way, but this is the very specific Jacobian matrix, so I'm writing it as J. Um, but we can characterize J um, alternatively, as in the basis of eigenvectors, by saying, look, if we have a vector x or a vector s, a, a state vector, multiplying s times s minus uh, to, to s inverse, what does that do? If I have a, if I have a matrix s in the in the um, in the sort of nominal characterization of state s x plus y you know x y and z say if i multiply that by s inverse so i have s inverse s what does that give me that where by the way it's capital s inverse times lowercase s right i i should be hissed out of the room probably but um uh hissed out of the room um so what does s inverse s give us what does s inverse what does it do what's what is S inverse doing? If I apply it to a state vector S, what is it doing? Yeah, so it's actually S inverse times S is actually taking S and it's giving the equivalent vector to S in the, in the basis of eigenvectors, okay? So it's transforming it to give me, okay, in this alternative coordinate system, the natural coordinate system, what is S? And then having been phrased in that natural coordinate system, this S inverse S, then all we have to do, if we know our vector in that natural coordinate system, the action of the Jacobian matrix is simply stretching in or pushing out along each of the eigenvectors. So all we have to do is multiply it by this, by this diagonal matrix. And some entries of the diagonal matrix would be less than one, like you know, 0.5 or something like that. And it'll, it'll pull in, uh, pull into that. Um, and some will be greater than one or two, and it will push out along that lines. Now, I'm actually glossing over things because the truth is, this is a dynamical system. We're reasoning about this in dynamical systems. So actually, the operative concern here is at less than zero or above zero. Because if it's less than zero, what will be happening is it'll be sucking in over time. It'll be like having a negative exponent. A negative exponent. It'll be like this. You know, we have a, a negative, or a, you know, alpha is, is between zero and, and infinity here. We have a negative uh, uh, exponent, and so it's going to suck things in along that dimension. And and uh, and uh, if if it's greater than zero, it's going to be pushing out. So it's, and we'll see this in our state space plots in a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. So um, and then after doing that, we just by multiplying by s on the left, we just okay. So. So we know what it's done to a vector in the natural eigen, the, the natural basis of this matrix. Now multiplying by s will transform it back into a vector in our normal comfortable coordinate system like x, y, z. 
So maybe the the, the basis of of this particular matrix was some instead of calling things by x, y, and z, we're going to call them by you know uh, x plus two y and you know uh, y minus three z in uh, I don't know um, uh, x plus y plus z or something like that. Maybe that's our eigen, you know, if we describe it this way, suddenly it's, uh, it's a decoupled system. Um, and so multiplying by S inverse takes something X, Y, Z and transforms it into this alternative basis. The natural basis multiplying it by this delta then s sort of stretches or pulls in each of those, uh, those components multiplying by S transforms it back into this basis, this other basis and collectively, S, lambda, S inverse completely describe the action of the Jacobian. It's just we've characterized it in a way that's mostly kind of boilerplate where we just are converting. And the real action of the Jacobian is nothing more than delta. It's just that's the, that is the Jacobian in the natural basis. It's, it's uh, easily specified uh, like that. Okay. Um, um, okay, so um, so that was a bit of a reminder about our, our previous lectures. Now, there's a very beautiful thing, which I, I don't have slides on, but I, I should probably tell you. I should probably tell you it. Mm, um, yeah. The cost of doing this off the top of my head. Um, okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll put it back to that slide. We have a bit of time. We can we can play with this. Um, okay. So I have this um, s dot equals for a linear system J S. J S. What am I doing? Um, oh my gosh, <coughs> um, JS, right? Forgive me, I'm dropping the arrows, okay? We all know they're arrows. It's full of arrows, okay? Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. They're, they're invisible arrows. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, okay, so if we have that, um, I'm going to draw an analogy to a system that's only involving a single, uh, a, a single, uh, a single element of the state vector. Okay, so I'm going to write it in a scalar term as let's say x equals a x. But here, x is just uh, one number, just just one number, hmm? and a is just a single number. Okay, it has to be. Or, or, or it's not going to be a. It's going to be a, a one by one matrix. So I'm going to write it as this. X and sorry, it's x dot equals alpha. X, right? You remember that? Okay. What? What's the solution to that? If I, if I, if I solve that every time, let's write it out in in greater detail, right? Um, so this is just when I write x dot. What am I really writing? Well, dx dt, right? This is kind of, I think, the Leibnizian, and this is the Newtonian way of writing it. Um, very sad thing. Those two had like a terrible ego fight. <laughs> like, who invented calculus first? And and it turned into like a national fight. Like the Germans um, had believed that Leibniz. Um, it was actually pre-Germany, as, as Paul would know. Um, but uh, but you know they, they believed Leibniz had originated it first, and Newton believed that he, the English believed Newton did. Um, but they basically evolved at essentially the same time and probably in the same intellectual milieu. I think Leibniz made that a bit earlier um, in the end, but but the English got like all huffy, and they ended up doing something very silly. They ended up like 
I think partly out of pride and pique, they disconnected from a, a lot of their development of mathematics, <laughs> fueled by this resentment and animosity. They, they basically said, we can do our own mathematics, thank you very much. Um, and they kind of took their ball and went home from Europe. I, I'll leave un, unsaid certain, certain resemblance to even the present day. Uh, <laughs> and they, they took their ball and went home. And, um, and so they ended up developing mathematics that was sort of stunted compared to the development on the continent. And you know, the, the continent had these unbelievably good mathematicians, uh, you know, Euler and Gauss, uh, many from Germany, but also many from France, you know, Pascal and Fermat and, and et cetera, and a whole, whole series of unbelievable ones. And English mathematics ended up being stunted and, and sort of contorted because of it. A bit like the English language, some might argue, but um, anyway. Um, okay, so so here we have dx dt equals lambda x, right? How do I solve that? In, in classical, if this were math 116, how would you solve that? Or if this were undergraduate mathematics? Well, the classic way of solving it is, what do you do? Okay, I mean, the, the sort of way that's phrased most commonly is you divide in both sides, you, you do something like this equals uh, alpha dg, you integrate both sides, and, and what's, what's this on the right-hand side? It's the integral of a, of a constant. It's like it's the area under a curve where the curve is constant. So what is it? Yeah, it's, it's alpha t, and then there's some constant in front, right? There, there's some, some constant uh, that, because, uh, you know, it, the derivative of alpha g is, is alpha, it's true, but, but c plus alpha t for an arbitrary number um, is also uh, the derivative of that, it goes into the null space, it's sort of mapped to zero. So, so it's c plus alpha t for some constant. And what's the derivative, what's the integral on the right hand side here? Yeah, it's log of x. And I'll, I'll write it here just, just in case it would help. It's one integral of one over x dx. Maybe, maybe if I write it that way, it would be more obvious, right? Um, and it turns out it's natural log of, of x, okay? Plus some constant, but I can subtract it from the one right? The okay? Um, we okay with that? And, oh, yeah, um, yeah. Um, okay, so, so what can I do now? Um, I could just take x, right? Right? Take the exponent on both sides? So what do I get if I take the exponent on the left hand side, what do I get? X, and what do I get on the right hand side? Yeah, e to the c plus alpha t, and what does this turn into here? It's, well, it's, how can I factor that? It's e to the c times e to the alpha t. Remember that? Um, which, you know, with this e to the c, I mean, it's just, it's just another constant. This is like e to the 2.3 or something, or e to the zero, right? And it's just another constant. Call it d, okay? I never liked using d. So it will be, okay? Um, so, and, and in general, we could re-express this as, let's not call it d, let's just call it the value of x at time zero times e to the alpha t, right? And so that's what, and actually I should really write, if I'm gonna be, this is, it's x of t, that, you know, I, I, I should have written over here, it's, it's, it's x, of, x of t, okay? Um, it's x as a function of, of, of time, okay? Um, so I could have put it up here, x of t. Okay, um, so x of t is just equal to x, the initial value of x times e to the alpha t, right? Mm -hmm. That makes sense, right? Because 
If we have an exponential, we take its derivative, what do we get out? We have an exponential like e to the alpha t, and we take its derivative, what do we get? Take d of that thing dt, what do we get? Alpha times it, right? Take the derivative of e to the alpha t, you get alpha times e to the alpha t. You get the same thing back, mm -hmm. just scaled. Does that remind you of something? Does that remind you of something? There are certain things in the world, ladies and gentlemen, where if you apply an operator to them, you get the same thing back, just scaled. And one of the things we talked about was eigenvalue. So it turns out that exponentials are eigenvectors of the derivative operator in Hilbert space. Okay, um, so they are the eigenfunctions of this, and it's really useful to think this way. You start to understand a whole lot of things if you you realize you can think of functions as vectors, and you can think of of like a, a multiplication of a function. I'll put it over here so you don't get confused with that. If you think of a multiplication of a function like by some exponential, um, uh, geez, if you think of this as like a dot product of two vectors, this is like a dot product of two vectors where you know it's g of t times this vector, and then you sum up, that's what you do with the dot product, right? You take successive multiplications like X, x dot product with y is simply the sum, sum that corresponds to the integral right? um, of x sub i times y sub i. And maybe I'll call it, instead of i, I'll call it t. Right? And it's just exactly the same thing. This is matrix multiplication just in the special infinite dimensional vector thing, okay? Uh, I remember being impressed by that as an MIT freshman um, uh, by Giancarlo Rota. Um, anyway, um, so ladies and gentlemen, here we have x of t equals x0 times e to the alpha t, right? That's the solution to this x equals alpha x. Well, guess what? Guess what? It turns out that this thing on the left, does that look similar? This look like the same thing. So I'm going to write the solution, ladies and gentlemen, to this thing on the left. Just drawing on that, OK? I'm going to write the solution. And you're going to probably protest, but I'm OK with that. OK? Is that OK? OK. Um, by the way, they say Einstein's, what dis I've heard it said that what distinguished Einstein was not, not predominantly him as a physicist, but he was a very good applied mathematician. And one of the, the really interesting characteristics of applied mathematicians is they know how much they can abuse things without trouble. So they take liberties and they know, okay, I'm in safe territory. I, I know it's kind of abusing things a bit, but it, this, it, this will be fine. It's no problem. Whereas there are certain things you could do when you go off and you know, back things happen. And so what I'm going to do is, is show you something that is a bit loose, but it actually works. Okay? So I mean, it, it, it's, it's sound. Um, so I'm going to write this as s dot. I'm going to write the SDT. That's, that's pretty, pretty innocuous, right? Um, maybe I'll write it over here. DSDT. Just the name for s dot equals that, right? Okay, I'm going to do the same trick. Okay, so if I write ds over s, right, equals what's on the right? Yeah, j times dt. Yeah, okay. And I take the integral of both sides. Okay. Um, Take the integral of both sides, okay? Um, and I'm going to get over on the left hand side, what am I going to get? Log, and I'm going to leave out the constant and just put it over on the right hand side, okay? Um, 
And this is not a dot of the J. It's a, it's a, these are not the droids you're looking for. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not a real dot. It wasn't an appended dot, OK? Um, uh, so this is uh, J of T plus um, some constant. And I'll call it D for, for, for that, OK? OK? Um, and then take the exponents of both sides. Okay, and, and like warning bells may be going off. Like I take the exponent to the left hand side, and what do I get? S, S of t. Yeah, yeah. S is a function of t equals. Uh, do I, do I go take the, the right hand side? What do I get? Okay, okay. So e to the d. By the way, what is d here? D is a vector. Right, and it's, it's got to be a vector because this thing on the left is a vector. Um, plus, so e to the d plus jt, right? Okay, and this is just equal to, I'm going to call it a vector s0. That's the initial vector, it's the initial state vector, it's the initial state, right? This is the initial state of the system times e to the jx, okay? Yeah? Are we okay with that? Okay, now. JT. JT. There's no X. That, that would fail to compile in math world. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I'd like a math compiler. Actually, the mathematics is not that in Okay. Okay, now. Thanks to this, maybe familiar. S of t, any problems with that? That's a vector as a, as, as a function of time. Are we okay with that? This initial state vector, are we okay with that? How about this guy? Mumble, mumble, mumble. Mumble. Okay? Okay, so let's unpack it. This is where it gets really fun. This is where it gets really fun. Okay. Um can I can I erase this lower part? Um oh, no, there's a lot of information. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I appreciate your probably Alex's sense of humor is a closer resonance of mine that of of any student I've ever met. Um, <laughs> it's 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 an awesome sense of humor. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, it's gonna keep me. Um, okay. Um, great. So, who remembers the definition of exponential? I wrote it, it was just about here for Taylor like two weeks. Sorry? Taylor, Taylor experience. And, and yeah, so e to the x equals what? Anyone remember? One plus. One plus. X plus. X plus. X squared. X squared o over. Two factorial, factorial, which happens to be two, um, plus x cubed over three factorial plus dot dot dot, you know, x n over n factorial, uh, all the way up as far as one, right? And when we truncate things with linear approximations, we often just say, oh, x squared is really small, we have small deviations. If we're leaving the fixed point boundary. Point one x squared is doing point oh one, and that's going to be tiny compared to the x term and the mumble, right? Okay, this is what this is. Okay, so now you're going to tell me what e to the jt is one plus jt. Okay, plus so this is a this is a, a matrix times a constant, okay? 
plus j t squared. Can we imagine squaring matrix? Yeah? Yeah? OK, over 2 factorial plus x cubed, so j t cubed over 3 factorial, right? OK. OK, right? And by the way, does something stick in your craw here? What, what doesn't? So we're adding a matrix plus a matrix plus a matrix. So the second term is a matrix. How about the first term? What does that need to be? I. It needs to be the identity matrix. So this is I, or you know, this matrix. It's a diagonal matrix with zeros almost everywhere, and then what on the diagonal? One. Okay. Okay. So might look at that and say, yeah, well, what about it? OK, the best part is about to come, OK? Because, ladies and gentlemen, J can be expressed as S lambda S minus 1, right? Uh huh? Uh huh? OK, but we know, and I'm, I'm waving my hands about Invertibility a little bit, but for 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 most commonly this is the case for, for our systems. Uh, they don't have repeated diagonals, etc. So if we assume this, okay, okay, this sort of symmetry transform, is the name for it, that I've heard of one. These things occur like everywhere. If you're dealing with 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 matri with linear algebra at a at a practical working level, these things are just like. And, and understanding them intuitively what's going on is very valuable. Okay, so J equals F. Okay, can I write rewrite this? Okay, so so if we if this is J, we we have E to the S lambda S minus one T, okay, equals I plus J T. So we substituted in S lambda S minus one T, right? Is it a T here? Right? Uh, okay. Um, plus S lambda S minus 1 T squared. Right? Remember, t, t is just a, just a number, it's a scalar, right? Plus S lambda S minus 1, oh, sorry, this would be squared, right? Squared, yeah. It's, it's cubed, it's cubed, right? Um, over three factorial plus da da da, right? Right? So, so it's just sorry. Sorry. Oh, t cubed. Yeah. I'll I'll write that. Squared, cubed. I'll just pull it out. It's enough. You okay with that? Okay, now, does anyone know where I'm going? What, what, what doesn't fit into this pattern that we had to deal with before two lines up? What doesn't fit into this pattern? Of, no, notice everything is this kind of boilerplate. S minus one on the right and S on the left, except one thing. What's that one thing? I. I. Huh? But, we could actually write I as yes, as I as inverse, right? Right. I mean, I times S inverse is just S inverse, and then S inverse times S inverse is just I. So it's the same thing, right? So now on the right hand side, I've got S on the left and and S inverse on the right everywhere, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, so I could rewrite this as S times, yeah, I plus lambda to the, and I'll write to the one power, T to the one power, plus lambda squared, uh, um, times t squared over 2 factorial 
plus lambda cubed times t cubed over 3 factorial plus da 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 times s inverse, right? Are we okay with that? Are we okay with that? Okay. Oh, good point. Good point. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank. Awesome. 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 Thank you for that question. That, that was one of the key, the most fun parts of it. This is one of the most fun parts of it because if you have, fortunately, I have a bit of a space here, right? If I have Let's consider S, S inverse squared, right? I can rewrite that as, without loss of generality, I can rewrite it as S, S inverse of that, right? And I can remove these parentheses because it's associative. And then guess what I can do? Oh, it's just awesome. It's just awesome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I can end up canceling this and canceling that. And I can end up canceling. And so the, these things stay. And so this turns into what? Yeah, so, so actually, I, 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 thanks to the Yan, yeah, uh, I was able to, to spot that. OK, so these two cancel. So we get s lambda squared s inverse, right? And the same thing is true if this is to the nth power. So I just put them in series and they all cancel. They all telescope. And they just, why does this turn into lambda squared? Because these two lambdas are multiplied, right? It all turn into lambda to the end, right? Yeah, so, so actually I, I, I miswrote this down here. It's actually, it's actually, um, uh, yeah, so, so this is actually lambda 1, this is actually lambda squared here, this is lambda cubed, right? And, and these turn into to these sort of things, okay? Um, okay, now, so this is, this is good, um, but what are the forms, like if I consider lambda squared, is that some horrible matrix with entries everywhere? No. What is it? It's a diagonal matrix with just the term squared, mm -hmm. right? If I consider lambda cubed, is that some horrible matrix with entries everywhere? No. It's just diagonal with those terms cubed, right? If I consider lambda, is that a ma horrible matrix with entries <laughs> everywhere? No, it's a it's a it's a, it's a matrix with just the diagonal elements, lambdas, right? Lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, the various lambdas, the eigenvalues, right? And is I, is that a horrible matrix? <laughs> with the entries everywhere? No, it's 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. It's a beautiful matrix. It's a beautiful matrix. Darn right it is. I know. I know. Um, no, it is awesome. It's awesome. Um, can we say i is equal to lambda to the zero, or is that not perfect? Yes, you can. Uh, yes, you can. You can. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. OK, so, so it turns out that you can consider this as a sum of matrices where each of them is diagonal. They're simply, they're simply multiplied by these appropriate t squared, t cubed, et cetera, right? And what this turns into, what this turns into, does this look a little bit familiar to something up here? Yeah, it turns out this is just S e to the lambda, S inverse, L t, thank you, S lambda t. Yeah. Sorry, that's really good. Okay, and guess what this turns into? This just turns into S, and it's a matrix like this, 
this s e to the lambda t is just a matrix with lambda 1 hmm, lambda 1 now I'll put it t it's just the eigenvalue matrix <laughs> so x the n down here yeah. so so ladies and gentlemen this whole thing turns in to to be oh sorry sorry I have to be careful this is e to the lambda one e to the lambda two e to the e to the lambda n right t t t, t. Yeah. this is probably doing it on the fly okay t right there's your t um okay nothing like a good cup of tea um okay ready so. Does this remind you of something? Yeah, it's just it's just uh, mumble. Uh, just this thing. This thing is this just for a single variable, but this whole thing is it just like with that. And this this s s inverse out front, all it does is transform it into the eigenspace, and then its solution is just this. Eh? It's just e to the lambda 1 t. So for with respect to the first eigenvector, it's evolving as e to the to its eigenvalue times t. Right? So in other words, the first eigenvector evolves over time by as as this thing, e to the alpha t. So here it's stretching this eigenvector or pulling it in. If, if lambda is negative, or sorry, if alpha is negative, it's pulling in that eigenvector along that axis. If lambda, lambda is, if one of these lambdas is positive, it's, it's growing exponentially along those axes, right? Remember this? I mean, this, if, if lambda is greater than zero, or sorry, alpha is greater than zero, well, forgive me. Um, uh, forgive me. I'm going to change this to lambda, <laughs> just just so that the analogy is is clearer to you, right? Look, I'm changing it from calling it alpha to calling it lambda. I mean, it's 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 just uh, it's no mathematical change. It's just uh, it's just a change in notation that I hope will make the analogy more completely clear, right? You see that? Do you see that? And so if, if lambda is greater than zero, it'll grow exponentially over time. If lambda is less than zero, maybe it starts here and it will decrease. Well maybe maybe I'll draw them on as if they start at the same point so that so that you know you have a point a stable point of reference. Exponential, right? Um, exponential growth if lambda is greater than zero. And if lambda is less than zero, it'll decay towards zero, right? Lambda less than zero, right? If lambda equals zero, what's it going to do? Just stay the same, right? Uh, it'll just be stable. Lambda equals zero. That's the steady state solution. All right, goes to infinity. Okay. So that's all this is. So what this is saying is that look, if you have a why is there another dot there? Oh, no, it is. That, that dot belongs there. It, because it was on the right hand side, but I, I put that. Okay, I put it, make it a big dot. Okay? Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a single variable system, you can solve it as the initial state of the system times e to the lambda t. Right? If you have a linear multivariate system, but it's linear in those. So you have s dot equal js. Through diagonalization, even if the system is nominally coupled at its start, you know, x depends on not only its own state, but the state of y and the state of z, or what have you, right? Like this. Um, if, excuse me, like, like if, if that's how it is in, in the, the way the system is created, if you end up Converting that 
if you end up finding the natural coordinate system for that system with this matrix of, uh, of, of, of by considering the eigenvectors whoa, of the system, um, right? Um, then we can actually use precisely the same mathematics to solve the system. And we basically see that the system evolves with each mode of the system, each eigen, if we describe the system in terms of its natural coordinate system, its natural eigenvectors, we see each of those, we call them modes of the system, evolving independently of the others. These are all zeros here. Each one doesn't depend on the others. It just evolves independently as e to the lambda, some lambda times t, just like this did. And so there, it's, a, it's a set of solitudes. Each of them evolves independent of the others according to some exponential. It could be a negative exponential, which case it's, it's sucking things in there. It's, it's everything that's out that way, it'll be sucking towards it. Sucking because it's the rate of change of things in that direction. They're being multiplied by e to the, say, e to the minus t. And so it's sucking in along that, or it's pushing out along that direction. Pushing out in a, you know, in a, in a strong way, and there may be some directions where it's sucking in, some directions where it's spinning out, or maybe it sucks in all. Of them. It just, you know, it sucks in from all directions, right? Or it's blowing out from all directions, like a quasar. Okay. Okay. So that that all comes out of it, and this is just the conversion into that coordinate system, and that's the conversion out here. Okay. Um, as I say, I've taken some liberties. Uh, there may be some details of this I'll go over, but I'll add it to the slide so you have it for future reference, okay? Uh, if there's any debugging that has to be done, I'll do that. But that's the basic deal is any system that's linear, we can actually use this basic mathematics to characterize it as a decoupled system. We don't need to be dealing with a coupled system if it's a linear system. We can always recharacterize it in a fashion that's decoupled, or at least for, for vast broad classes of system, to a system that's decoupled and that evolves according to this. Okay? Now, I'm going to build on this fact to go to look at some particular systems here. But we always can take a linear system, view it from a very particular perspective, its natural perspective, its eigen perspective its own perspective, uh, hence the eigen. And, and by so doing, we can describe it in a particularly simple, decoupled means of considering its evolution. And we don't have to worry about, for evolving each aspect of state, we don't have to worry about the, the, the values of the other aspects of state, right? Each one doesn't have to worry about the others. Um, OK. so. So that's, that was uh, a little bit of a, of a comment there. Let's see how it applies to, oh, I, I do want to emphasize one thing, though, that will become increasingly key for the coming lectures. Here, this transformation, where he diagonalized according to S, if we consider taking j equals s lambda s minus 1, I would emphasize that the number that, if we consider the number of elements of the s vector, it turns out that our natural basis, our natural way of describing the system is in terms of vectors that have that same number of elements. Okay. So we're transformed from something that's maybe described in x, y, z. Forgive me, my, my, my foreign slang came out there. Um, x, y, z. Um, we're transforming it into a vector in this alternative coordinate system. But the, the number of elements here, these are both in R3, they're, 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 the vectors involve three real numbers. 
we're not saving at all um, how, how many state variables we need to describe the system. It's still described in the terms of the same number of state variables, even though it's a simpler description. Each of those state variables evolves independently, right? So this system is not naturally coupled. It's just coupled from a certain perspective, set of perspectives. But from its natural perspective, it can be characterized in a totally decoupled way. Okay? Um, and the whole is nothing more or less than the sum of the parts. Okay? Um, okay, now, for a nonlinear system, um, the situation is, is, is totally different. Okay? Um, and most of the systems we deal with within our sphere of activity of our labs, these, these are nonlinear in character. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a classic case, of course, of this is you can't describe an infectious disease transmission system effectively as a linear system because what are, what are two elements of state that have to interact uh, within such a system? Well, look, there's going to be no infections if you have, no matter how many susceptibles you, are, you have, this can be no infections unless you have what? Infectives, right? So it's, it's not possible to describe susceptibles without considering infectives as well. But if we consider the rate of change of infectives, how many people are like coming into it from a susceptible state due to new infections, there's going to be no chance of doing that unless we also take into account susceptibles. So there's actually, it, it, for nonlinear systems, it'll be not possible to decouple the way. And, and what you'll see in these nonlinear systems is, very commonly, these terms that are based on things like S times I. Right? That's a nonlinear term. It's not like 2 times S, the number of susceptibles, or, you know, 2s plus 3y or something like that. It's s times i. That's not a linear function of state. Right? Okay. So we're going to be dealing with these um, with these nonlinear systems. And uh, with nonlinear systems, we're not going to be able to reason about the behavior of the system as a whole by summing up information about the behavior of its pieces. Um, the Jacobian here is going to vary. It's, we, we can't just compute the Jacobian and have it be a constant matrix. The Jacobian will vary with system state. It will have elements where the, its value for those different elements will, will depend on state. So if we have a term SI, and we have even, let's just say, we're considering SI dot, you know, this, we're going to be if this SI is associated with the flow from susceptibles to infectives, for example, the things that evolve the, the governing equation F, the component of that that evolves S, we're going to need to consider partial F sub X, or call it sub S here, right, for susceptibles. Um, by the way, here I'm using S for susceptibles. There I used it for more general state. Partial S, uh, partial S, and partial F sub S partial I, right? Um, this partial, if we could, let's suppose this is, suppose F sub S, it's, it involves some minus, you know, some, some beta SI, right? Um, partial F sub S, partial S is going to be what? Yeah, it's going to be minus, so just, just to illustrate this, it's going to be minus beta, let me take this derivative with respect to S, particularly holding I constant, it's minus BI, right? Um, and F sub S with respect to I, it's going to be minus BS, right? And, and this, these entries depend on state. This is not, these are not numbers, just numbers in general. It's, it's going to depend on state. 
And so the value of the Jacobian will be different in different areas of state space. If S is different and I is different, it'll be different, the Jacobian, right? Um, and we can't assume here, oh, this final thing is going to be critical for our exploration of, of um, uh, system data science. We cannot assume that the system as a whole is the same dimensionality as the nominal dimension, okay? So if we characterize it in terms of S and I, or S, I, and R, S, E, I, R, um, for the nominal dimensions, um, or to, uh, as it's naturally phrased, it may be that the intrinsic dimensionality of the system, the sort of the underlying natural dimension of it, has a far lower, a far lower uh, dimensionality. Because these things are so coupled, so inherently coupled, that basically if we know the number of S, we know the number of R and I and E or something along those lines. So it may be that we can reduce this to, say, just two dimensions. Uh, by contrast, in a linear system, we, we can always decouple, we, we can decouple it into a, a system, but it has the same number of dimensions. Okay, so let's, let's look at it. Here's this SIR, SIR system, right? We have some transmissibility, we have some force of infection, some number of contacts per day, prevalence of infection. This is pretty familiar to all of you, and we can re-describe this as a system. Is this a linear or nonlinear system? Nonlinear, because the number of people being infected depends on, if we unpack this, um, we're going to have, right, we're going to have a number of contacts per day times the prevalence of infection. The prevalence of infection is going to be, let's suppose the total population is a, if we assume it's a constant here, it's some in number of infectives divided by some constant, right? Um, so we're gonna have times something involving number of infectives. And each of these susceptibles is subject to this, um, this contact times trans transmissibility times prevalence of infection. Each susceptible is gonna be uh, subject to that hazard rate. So we're gonna have a, a formula for infection that ultimately boils down to a bunch of constants times S times I just like up, up on that board, some beta times s times i. So this is a nonlinear system. Okay, let's, let's think about it. Okay, um, so when we think about these nonlinear systems, um, we're going to need to be very conscious of, because the Jacobian will be changing in different areas of state space, we're going to have to be very conscious about where we're talking about in state space. So here's our system. We have some constant, which is a, which depends on co contact rate and transmissibility beta and, and uh, the size of the population. Let's say um, it, it, it all boils down to minus 0.01, okay? So here we have ds dt essentially equals minus 0.01 s times i, right? X is s, y is i number of infectives, S is number of susceptibles. Okay, DDT of YDT or, or, F of, or I of T is equal to 0.01 X, so this is S times I, um, minus uh, 0.1 times S. What does this 0.1 represent? It's a rate of, I'll give you a hint, R, uh, uh, Z is R. So what is, what is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, this is a recovery of, of those, okay? So the Jacobian, if we take the Jacobian, we get, we get this thing here. And notably, it depends. The values of the Jacobian depend on the value of the state, right? Now, um, you may ask, well, what are, the, what are the fixed points for this? What are the points at which it no longer changes, right? Um, uh, and it turns out that there's many such fixed points. In fact, there's a, there's a, you know, it's infinitely many, continuous uh, many, because any, any point which has y equals zero here will have no rate of change. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Uh, 
No, this is actually no infectus. It's true no susceptibles will also have no infections, but that's a very particular point, it turns out. But, but in general, anything where Y, yeah, actually, um, so excuse me, it's not the case. Let, let's unpack this. Very good question. Very good question. Alex asked some really good questions, and I appreciate that. Um, so let's consider the case of y equals 0. If I have y equals 0, why, why is it that, the deriv that, that we're at a fixed point? What, what defines a fixed point, ladies and gentlemen? I should have said a fixed point, an equilibrium point, a point of balance. How, how can we know something's a fixed point? If we, the, the rate of change of all state variables is 0. 0. Right? Okay, so let's take y equals zero. Is this first term? What's its rate of change? If y of t is zero, what's its rate of change? Zero, right, because it's something times zero. How about this next one? y of t is zero, the first term is zero, second term is zero, third term, zero. Mm -hmm. It's going to be zero across. So anything involving y equals zero, no matter how high the number of susceptibles is, as long as it's within the population, it's going to be a fixed point. How about if we only, suppose we only have x as zero, but suppose in general we're, we don't have y in, as zero. Will this be a fixed point? Will the first term, what, what's this? For dx, it, x times y will be s times i. So if we have zero x uh, s's, will this be zero? Be zero. How about this next term? Well, how about the first term of that, x times y? That'll be zero. But the next one, not necessarily, because if we have, there's still recovery that can be going on. And so people could be coming into and recovered from infectives. So in general, we won't have that actually for zero susceptibles. We will have zero new infections, but we won't have, uh, we won't have uh, a complete balance. Okay, so I examined it here for a, a set of different fixed points. Uh, because we have infinitely many to choose from, continuously infinitely many, I, I, I picked sort of three. For the naive equilibrium where everyone is susceptible, no one is infected, no one has recovered, this is the Jacobian, okay? Now, if we take the eigenvalues of that, these eigenvalues, these lambdas here, the first two are zero, but the third is 9.9. .9. What is that telling us? Yeah, it's going to be, is this going to be growing or shrinking? Growing. It's unstable. It's going to be rapidly growing. It's e to the 9.9 .9 times t. But it's going to be growing out along a certain vector. Okay? These are the eigenvectors uh, below here. This first vector, just constant. It's, it's actually not going to be changing. Eigenvalue of e to the 0. Uh, eigenvalue 0, so it's e to the 0 times t, which is just going to be constant. This, next, this last one, recovered, won't be changing. But this one will be the one that's growing according to e to the, to e to the 9.9 .9 t. So it's going to be, what is it going to be uh, uh, doing here, okay? Uh, along those dimensions, um, uh, it's going to be s sort of stretching it, uh, stretching it out in certain dimensions and, uh, and, and pulling it in in, in others, okay? Um, excuse me, no, 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 it's just, it's, it's actually growing along in the, okay, I have to be very careful here. I have to be very careful. I said this is the eigenvectors, fair enough. And the eigenvalues of this, so it grows as e to the, the, lambda, the lambda t according to this but only around this, this fixed point, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a linear system. I can't say that everywhere in state space it's gonna be growing according to this. I can only say in the immediate vicinity of this disease-free equilibria, um, we're going to be having a, 
a rate of change associated with this uh, that's going to vary in a certain way, okay? And, and here, and this is, okay, I, I uh, mm, that's, that's very interesting. Okay, I need to think about that a bit. So that's for the naive equilibrium. For the half recovered equilibrium, so here we have half recovered, that changes the eigenvectors um, and we're going to, and the eigenvalues in fact. And here it's going to be pulling in along this uh, eigenvalue. It's going to be decreasing it along there. And this all recovered, um, it's going to be, uh, and that's, that's interesting, it's gonna be pulling in along one dimension, it's gonna be growing, it looks like, oh, sorry, um, excuse me. For the eigenvalues, it's gonna be increasing one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, eigenvectors, but, um, uh, but the, the other two are going to stay the same. Um, I want to get to a slightly more interesting example to finish with here. So I'm going to go a little bit quickly here. I would just note that the state space associated with this is three-dimensional, so it's a bit hard to, to reason about. But fundamentally here, what's going to happen is um, uh, we're, if we start with a state where it's essentially virtually all infective, or sorry, all susceptible, only one uh, infective, and one recovered, what we're going to have is a, a decrease in the number of susceptibles, an increase in the number of infectives, and then slowly an increase in the number of, of, of uh, recoveds. So it's going to convert susceptibles to infectives and then to recovered individuals, and it's going to be pulled this way and pulled that way. Um, and if we project it down to like z times y or x times z or y times z, um, we'll be able to see this. So for example, x times y, x is starting large. This is the number of susceptibles. It pulls it down as y increases here and, and then they recover. And people are of course recovering all along, but towards the end, there's no one less to be, left to be infected. So it's all basically um, recovered individuals. Okay. Um, now we could reduce this um, by recognizing, how could we simplify this, anyone? How could we simplify this? What is constant here? What's invariant? Well, the total population, I alluded to it as a constant. So based on that, we could re-express recovers as just what? Total population minus the number of susceptibles. That's misspelled, that's horrible and minus the number of infectives. Um, okay, um, uh, rest assured, if I find misspellings of susceptible in your models, it, I also misspell it sometimes. <laughs> um, so here, if we re-express it this way, then we have a 2D state space, and we can see this. This is the Jacobian here, um, and here we start with large number of susceptibles, the number of infectives rises, the number of susceptibles falls, and then the number of, and then this both fall to zero because the rest go to what? Recovered. Okay, Let's, here's the SIRS system. This one's more interesting. This one's rather more interesting. What's the difference of this from the, from the one we saw, the SIR? What else is going on? Waning of immunity. You have people going from recovered back to susceptible, and that makes all the difference. Now, we have, anyone want to guess? How many fixed points? Two. One, can you characterize them for me? What would be two points where the system's in balance? One is, okay, with what? All susceptible, no infectives. It'll be in balance. Nothing is changing. There's no one to infect people. Everyone is susceptible. Um, how about another fixed point? Then they go back. Yeah, that's the. 
then, the, then they'll be going back here. So it won't be in balance. It'll be draining back. But there is one where it's all in balance. If these are in the right proportions, the rate of new infections will exactly equal the rate of, of recovered. And the rate of new infections will equal the rate at which people are waning immunity. And the rate of recovery will equal the waning of immunity rate. It's all completely in balance. And indeed, there is such a fixed point where it's completely imbalanced. It's called an endemic equilibrium. Endemic because the disease is established in the population. So we can compute the Jacobian for different uh, fixed points. Here's the Jacobian in general. Um, by the way, I've, uh, I've, I've turned it into a 2D. I did the same trick with saying, OK, R is just total population minus S minus I to, so, so we don't have to visualize it in 3D space, okay? Um, this is the Jacobian. You can do the appropriate uh, uh, mathematics. By the way, this 10 comes from multiplying 0.01 times, uh, yeah, 0.01 times uh, 1,000 minus uh, <coughs> X minus Y. How it was phrased. I should really put that in there. Okay, the, these are the eigenvalues, okay, at the appropriate Jacobians, at the appropriate locations. So, to reason about the behavior of these sort of systems, nonlinear systems, if we consider their behavior at fixed points, then we will have, and I should really have a slide that will show this. But in general, for one of these systems that's nonlinear, we cannot write um, excuse me, we cannot write some Jacobian times S. Why not? Well, it's it's not linear. There's another key term here that I'm I'm leaving out, okay? Because in general, you will have a term that actually involves so if this is f of s, for a nonlinear system, so this is for nonlinear systems, um, we are going to have some term uh, at that point in state space, okay, um, uh, that, that, excuse me, um, well, j is going to vary for different points in state space is one way to say it. So it's not, this is, in, for linear systems, this was a fixed matrix. It's not a fixed matrix for nonlinear systems. So we can't write it as a fixed matrix times some state vector S. Okay? Um, and uh, however, at fixed points, it turns out we're going to be able to reason about this um, around those fixed points because at the fixed point, and I, I really should have this, this slide here. S dot at some fixed point, I'll call it S star, is going to equal F of S at S star plus, so this is around that fixed point, plus some fixed Jacobian, a fixed Jacobian at S star the value of the Jacobian at a certain point times, anyone wanted to tell me? S minus S star. This is just the displacement. This is going to be approximately equal for a, for a, a, for a nonlinear system. If we consider a fixed point, S star, we can consider how does the, the system behave around a certain point in general. We can compute f, f of s star here, and then we can consider what is this thing? This is j, right? And you have j times this displacement from s star. So this is the first part of plus higher order terms I can put here, right? Now, I walked you through this a couple lectures ago. I don't know if this is fresh, but if this is a fixed point, so if s star, so this is in general for some s star, right? For general 
general S star, right? Uh, right? For for tip for S stars in in general. Um, uh, if S star is a fixed point, what do we know is true? What do we know is true? Fs star is what? Is zero. And so then we get, then we are going to get, should be an equal, should be a colon. Um, then, then we're going to get, so for this, then, right? S dot at S star equals, well, it's going to be 0 plus that. So it's going to be J of S star. So Jacobian at S star, at that fixed point, it's going to be no counterfeiting there either. Um, OK. Um, times S minus S star, OK? Um, it's going to be approximately equal to this, right in the vicinity of this. So we can figure out the value of the Jacobian at a given fixed point. And if we consider displacements for that fixed point in a certain direction from that fixed point, we could ask, how does the Jacobian matrix handle those displacements? So these are no longer absolute vectors being multiplied by the Jacobian, like S. It's S minus S star. It's displacements from that fixed point. If we go in a certain direction from that fixed point, how does it change it? And, and that's exactly what's, uh, what's going on here. So we have these eigenvectors. So what this is telling us, ladies and gentlemen, in short, and I think we'll walk back on this uh, in further detail next time, but what this is telling us at, at the disease-free equilibrium, at the point where everyone is susceptible, no one's infected, no one is recovered, is this system going to expand or contract? Is it going to be stable or unstable? It's unstable if it would multiply faster and faster in that vicinity. It's stable if, it, if it's just going to pull things towards it and, and, and not change faster and faster, but slower and slower. Well, this 9.9 .9 indicates it's going to be e to the 9.9 .9 t, which is going to be, it's going to explosively grow in a certain direction. But uh, another eigenmode, it's going to be pulling towards it, OK? And these are the associated eigenvectors, OK? So this 1, 1, 0, it's going to be pulling smaller slowly. Um, but this one minus uh, seven and, and 7 here, it's going to be explosively, uh, it's, it's going to be uh, sort of pulling things in from that, or, or pushing things out in that direction faster and faster. And what's the action of this going to do? It's going to be decreasing the susceptibles and increasing the infectives. And what, how about this endemic equilibrium? Is the system in balance here? Or excuse me, it's in balance at the equilibrium. It's in balance. F of S star equals zero. It's in perfect poise. But is this a stable situation or unstable? This one was unstable. It was stable as long as we had everyone susceptible. But if we brought one infected person, it was bad news. It would explode. It would explode by causing fewer and fewer susceptibles and more and more infectives. And by the way, you can see the number of new infectives is not quite equal to the number of susceptibles being depleted because some people are recovering. But that's another matter. I think that's my interpretation of it. But for this endemic equilibrium, where it's in balance, what's going on here? It's actually stable. So if we have an endemic equilibrium, if we have one more person coming into the population is infective, is it going to explode? No, it's not going to explode. Both directions, it's actually stable. What will happen is, oh, we'll have somewhat more 
where covered is occurring. Um, but it's already in such a situation that each infective is only going to infect one, one, one susceptible um, very closely, roughly speaking. And so you're, you're not going to have it taking off. They're not going to be able to do at most, they'll be able to replace themselves with someone. If you get a busload of new infectives coming in, there's so few susceptibles around, at most they'll replace each other before they recover. They'll infect at most one, one uh, infective, new infective before they recover. Yes? So is there a point at which if the force of infection is great enough, uh, the bottom eigenvalue becomes positive and then it always comes up? Good question, because this is only, Excellent question, as normal analysis. Excellent. Um, so the answer is this is a local analysis. So this is purely around that fixed point. Is it possible that if you push enough, you get out of control? The answer is yes, and we'll be seeing an example like that potentially next Tuesday. Okay, well, where you have lock-in effects and where you know if there's enough, it might be able to drive. For example. Maybe you have, instead of a bus load coming in, suppose you had an ocean liner coming in filled with sick people. Yes. It might overwhelm the ability of the public health system to treat them in time. And so they spread infection in the population um, where normally they'd recover quickly enough, they only infect one person or something like that. I could imagine so I a situation. So it's a, it's a local analysis. Here it's saying it's right around this point, it's stable. But you're right, if you push it too far, you may go into what's called another basin of attraction, which basically you push it over a boundary where now you're dealing with a different fixed set of fixed points in a different situation. So that can't happen. I, I meant more like the, the part of the equation for the force of infection that does not yet take into account the effectives. If that's like really high, if, if hmm. Okay, we'd have to unpack that. Let's see if we could, we could uh, take that offline or talk about it next time. So if you look about it, this is what's going on. Uh, for, the, if, for the case of the disease-free equilibrium, what you have is it is growing. This is the actual, uh, so the actual fixed point is this guy down here. And if you're here, and you get displaced even a little bit off of that, you will grow rapidly, right? It's just like, it's like this, right? Um, stable, it's in a stable equilibrium, but it accelerates. If I push it a little bit off that stable equilibrium, it will accelerate away from it. That's what's going on here. This accelerates away from this, given the excuse of one infective coming in, giving an infective coming in, it'll accelerate. It'll push along that eigenvalue, that eigenvector, with increasing, you know, amplify it, amplify it, e to the 9.9 t. This eigenvector, this eigenvector will be, it'll be, it'll be pushing. By the way, it's decrementing number of uh, susceptibles, and it's incrementing the number of of infectives, the scaling is a bit different, so the, the angle is, is a bit off from what you might think naively, but it's, it's growing the number of infectives and it's shrinking the number of susceptibles, right? Right around that point, around that point. Okay, here is the endemic equilibrium. I actually started it at the upper part of this kind of blue thing and it sucked it down to this point here. Do you see that? So here, it's actually sucking in from certain directions. You can see in the, the X and Y, it's, 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 uh, it's sucking in here, and it's sucking in along this kind of skewed direction or, or, or different direction. It's, it's not 45 degrees or anything, but it's, it's sort of uh, along these lines. Those are its kind of two natural lines. It's sucking in along this axis, and it's sucking in along this axis, and those correspond to these um, to these eigenvectors here. Okay, um, so um, one of them is going. Um, it has this major axis associated with uh, uh, 
these two, the other is, is the, reverse, uh, the reverse direction. So this one is all stable. It's just if there's a perturbation, if we sort of drive it out here, it'll suck back. If we drive it out here, it'll be sucked back. And these arrows right around this point whisper to us of the eigenvectors. Around that point, these are the natural coordinates. Sort of talking about these and these. Those are the ones where we can describe its action around that point in a decoupled way. But more broadly, we can't describe the system as a whole in a decoupled way. It's inherently tangled in a way that the whole is different than the sum of its parts. We can't take it apart into its pieces. Um, and all we can reason about is around equilibria where f sub s sub st s star is zero at the equilibrium where it's in balance, what does it do right around there? Right around there, it, it has this natural way of describing its action that's basically linear. But if we go outside of that, funky things start to happen. Like it starts to twist and, and churn and you'll have different basins of attraction, et cetera. Very importantly, when you have a system like this, the action of that system um, cannot, be it cannot be described in terms of its pieces. And very importantly, the natural way in which we can describe this system can, can be much lower dimensionality because one state variable is so coupled with the other that, um, that all we need to know is fewer pieces of information and we can know about how the other one will behave. Okay, so that's all for today. I'll uh, come back and take this further next time. We will see a case with multiple basins of attraction and we will start to reason about uh, the cycles around these fixed points in a way that puts us in the situation to start reasoning about the dimensionality of the intrinsic system in the data science perspective. Okay? So That's how, yeah. Yeah, so can you um, see whether the, uh, this, this stable point is stable or not based on the eigenvectors? Correct. Yeah, so, so basically, great question, I should have said that. A given fixed point will be stable if all the eigenvalues at that fixed point are negative. And maybe zero, but uh, yeah, I guess you could say zero. Um, so in other words, if it's sucking in there, a perturbation will be brought back to zero. It's kind of like in a first order delay, um, you know, it'll be brought back to zero. If you add to a stock that has a first order delay associated with it as a flow out depending on the value of the stock, if you add something to the value of the stock, it'll be brought back down to zero. It'll be drained back down. So if all the eigenvalues are negative, it's stable. No matter of the eigenvectors. No matter of the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors are just a natural way of describing the action of the of that system of the Jacobian right around the the fixed point. And we'll, we'll try to emphasize this intuition next time. But the eigenvectors tell you if you go in certain directions around the fixed point, how does the the kind of system change as you go in those directions? So if I go up this way, for example, how does the system change? It tends to pull me exponentially this way. If I go this way, it tends to pull me in at a different rate of, of pulling. Yeah, yeah, so I feel if the eigenvector is one positive, one negative, then it will be good. The eigenvector? Yeah. No, the eigenvector, the eigenvector is as a whole being compressed over time or stretched over time according to this eigenvalue. You could make each eigenvector, you could flip its sign, and it's still going to be an eigenvector, right? If, yeah. if, if it's yeah. an eigenvector of a matrix, yeah. if, if, if E is an eigenvector of this matrix, so is minus E. So if you know, AE equals lambda E, um, 
if, if this is true, lambda is just some number, right? Yeah. Um, then it's true that a, a times minus e is, is simply lambda times minus e, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so it's the, the sign of an eigenvector, and even its magnitude doesn't matter if I scaled it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't matter. Those are just the natural coordinate system, whether it's going, I mean, when you say it doesn't matter, what I'm saying is that's not the determining factor for whether it's stable or not. Whether it's stable is, does it explosively grow? That's kind of the definition of stability is if we perturb it in this area, if we disturb it, we, we take it, it, we're in this point of balance, and then we disturb it slightly, does that disturbance restore itself or does it accelerate? You know, if it restores itself, if it brings, if a disturbance brings it back, that's like having a first order delay where we could add a thousand to it and it would just decay back down to zero. It would, it would be self-restoring because if we added a thousand to the stock of a first order delay, you know, it'll drain faster and it'll be brought down to zero, right, towards zero. Whereas if we have something where, you know, disturbing it in a certain direction, like a disease-free equilibrium, where we have a small disturbance, like someone coming in, no one in our city has ever been exposed to measles or vaccinated against us. And we have someone with measles arrive at the Saskatoon airport then we can get a rapid acceleration away from equilibrium because one person comes in, two people get it from them, maybe, maybe you know, two people get it from each of them, so you get four to eight to 60, and I'm understating it because it's estimated it's ours, it's ours or not, it's, uh, it's uh, basic reproductive constants like 16 or something. So maybe the first person gets, you know, gets 16 people sick, the next, each of those get you know, another 16, so 256, you know, another, and then, then it goes up to, what, 64,536 or something like that. Um, so you keep on multiplying, right? And so there, that's dictated purely by the eigenvalues. So, so in short, the eigenvalues give you this sense of stability. Now, it's all about the eigenvalues, but I will share with you that the analysis of what is the right matrix to use for the eigenvalues? It's a little bit subtle. It involves what's called the next generation matrix, which for these is really simple. But for systems that are more complicated, like where you might have several suscept uh, exposed stocks or se several infective stocks, et cetera, some are different than others, et cetera, um, formulating a stability criteria is slightly more, it's, it, it, it takes a bit more care but you can still do it with what's called the next generation matrix. But, but it's all about the eigenvalues there too. It's just the eigenvalues of what matrix. And the eigenvalues here are, are, can just be, be read out. So this one on the left, fix, uh, the disease-free equilibrium is unstable. This one on the right, it's stable. It's stable because it's, it's just like that first sort of delay, it's pulling in, it's, 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 it's causing less and less difference along those, each of those appropriate eigenvectors. On the one on the right, it's pulling in along one eigen, uh, eigen uh, uh, direction and it's, uh, it's amplifying along another. And by the way, you could see it, I don't know if you could see it, but there's arrows yeah. down here, it's sort of pulling in along these directions, the x direction. It, th so the arrows are going this way here, going this way. It's actually pulling in, which is why one zero is an eigenvector associated with a negative eigen, eigenvalue here, okay? Um, uh, it's, it's tending to, if you have a displacement by adding another, um, another susceptible, um, uh, it'll, it'll tend to sort of uh, 
cancel it itself out in terms of the effects. And, uh, and here, here it's, it's amplifying uh, this change, okay? Okay, hope those are helpful, yeah. Okay, very good. Christine, the schedule didn't make up 